Bruch Maboyim. Welcome to our home. Thank you very much for attending. The, um, the lecture this week will be dealing with the uh, Olympics, and uh, which just ended, and uh, Judaism, the connection. So I would like to begin my uh, thought this week with a story. They tell the story about the Holy Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was giving a class to his students in a meadow on a sunny day. He was telling them that nothing, nothing in life that you experience is an accident. Every action that we see, even a leaf moving across a meadow, does so only by the command of God Almighty, with a purpose. As he was speaking to them, the wind carried a leaf to and fro, and it danced lightly in the air. They all watched as it landed gently on the grassy meadow. One of the students turned to the Holy Baal Shem Tov and asked, So what was the purpose of the leaf landing in the spot where it's resting? So the Baal Shem Tov told the student to go over to the leaf and gently lift it up. And so he did. The Baal Shem Tov asked him what he saw under the leaf. The student answered, A caterpillar. The Baal Shem Tov smiled. And then he told the students, With this we see just how much concern God has for all of his creations. He is concerned even for the little caterpillar that is burning up in the sun. And so, to give it comfort, God brings a leaf to cover it as protection from the rays of the scorching sun. The Baal Shem Tov continued, If God Almighty is so concerned about the needs of a simple caterpillar, imagine how much more he must care about each and every one of us, his children. We whom he created in his very own image with the breath of his lips. The Olympics just ended this Sunday. It is estimated over three billion people were watching. So based on the words of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, what is it that we are supposed to have learned from the Olympics and those Olympians that competed? Every two years, the world comes together to participate in either the summer or winter Olympics. In a time when there is so much division in the world, it's nice to think that we can still come together as a world to enjoy athletics at its highest level. But there has to be more to the Olympics than just another sporting event. What lessons can we learn to help us as the spectators to become better athletes physically, mentally, and spiritually in the game that we play daily, which is the days of our lives? So what does it take to become an Olympic athlete? First and foremost, of course, raw talent. If God has not blessed you with certain attributes such as speed, strength, and agility, then all the time and effort in the world will not elevate you to the level of Olympian. We can add, of course, good health. If you're injured, you can't compete. So let's say that God has blessed you with raw talent. Is that all you need? I think not. Olympians are groomed from early adolescence. They are developed through hard work and dedication. They have tunnel vision. There is only one goal in their mind, being the best in the world at whatever sport that they compete in. They are taught that the key to success is discipline. Thinking about these attributes, I realized that sports and religion have a great deal in common. So what does it take to become a Torah scholar? First and foremost, intellect. If one were to melt down all of Judaism into one word, the word would be discipline. Intellect is not enough. It is just where we begin. God gives us the gift of intellect and then he challenges us to use it. He expects us to stay the course, not because we want to, but because he wants us to succeed. God has given us his Torah, his most precious possession, an instruction manual for us to study. He has done so in the hope that we can train ourselves to be the best person possible. They tell the story of Reb Zusha who was on his deathbed and he was crying. His students asked him why he was crying. He told them, I'm not crying for fear that the heavenly court will ask me, why wasn't I like Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher? No, I'm afraid they will ask me, hmm, why, why wasn't I like Zusha? Most athletes begin their training when, as I mentioned, they're still very young. They, get, they then dedicate all their free time and energies into training. 
Many times they get up early in the morning to begin their workouts. I have a niece, her name is Eden, who was on our high school swim team. She would get up before 5 a.m. in the morning, and by 5.30 a.m., she was already in the pool at her school doing laps. This was hours before she would attend her first class. Dedication. For an athlete to be successful, they must have self-confidence. They must believe in themselves. The saying goes, if you think that you are going to lose, <laughs> guess what? You will lose. Giving up is never an option. Success comes to those who stay the course. You know, the difference between receiving a medal or not is many times decided by one one hundredth of a second. The word triumph tells it all. The difference between a winner and a loser is one who tries with a little more oomph. Teaching our children about God when they are young is essential to their spiritual development. Through our example, we help them to recognize and appreciate the honor and the privilege that we have been afforded to be able to serve the one and only God in the world. You know, we start their training from the age of three, and the training never ends. Even as adults and senior citizens, we still continue to train. We never stop trying to improve our relationship with God, our Father, and with man, our friend. Life is a challenge. That challenge never ends. But hopefully, with hard work and the help of God, we can get better and better each and every day. Serving God is not just a day job. It starts when we wake up in the morning with the words, Mo da'ani l'fanecha, melechai v'kayom. I offer thanks before you, living and eternal King. We begin our day with gratitude to our Father in Heaven for granting us yet another day. The day finishes at night with the evening prayer and the recitation of the Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel, a prayer in which we reaffirm our love and allegiance to our Creator. We say these words, these words before we return our soul to Him for safekeeping all through the coming night. If we follow our training properly, we will be able to connect everything that we do, even that which is seemingly mundane, to the service of our Creator. Focus. Focus is a critical factor in achieving success in any arena, especially sports. Losing focus can cost more than a medal. It can cost you an injury or even worse, your life. You would think that focusing on an event that you have spent a good portion of your life preparing for would be a no-brainer. You know, I was watching the Olympics one year, and there was a young lady, a gymnast, who was doing her routine on a beam. Now, the beam is only four inches wide. She was performing her routine, doing all types of flips and turns. And then the announcer said she had lost her concentration. I wondered... Here she was in the moment, the culmination of all the years, months, weeks, days, hours, and minutes, all the sweat and all the pain, all that she had worked so hard to reach and she had lost her concentration. What else could she possibly have been thinking about other than winning a gold medal? And yet she had lost her concentration. Staying focused seems to be so simple. <laughs> well, think again. Life is all about staying awake at the wheel. How many of us find it difficult, if not impossible, to really focus on our prayers? It seems that no matter how hard we try, our minds still drift to other thoughts. Rather than focusing on the words in the prayer book, we find ourselves thinking of anything and everything else. Many of us just give up, but not an Olympian. An Olympian would try again and again. Quitting is not part and parcel of being an Olympian. And so too with our prayers. We do not have the permission to give up. You know, giving up is not one of the 613 commandments. We all know about the Olympics that feature the top athletes around the world. However, in 1968, Eunice Mary Kennedy Shriver, who was an American philanthropist, and a member of the Kennedy family, founded the Special Olympics, a sports organization for persons with physical and intellectual disabilities. Special Olympics competitions are held every day all around the world, including national, local, regional competitions. 
adding up to more than 100,000 events a year. Special Olympics provides year-round training and activities to 5 million participants in 172 countries all around the world. What we see when we view these athletes that compete in the Special Olympics is that they learn a, an important lesson in life. Never give up. They are encouraged to push themselves past their comfort zone. They earn the satisfaction of hard work and perseverance in their achievements, but cannot be measured in weight or distance or time. It can only be measured in effort and determination. They push themselves in an attempt to exceed their potential. God has put them in this earth with a challenge, and they have accepted it and have moved forward. Because success is relative to the person and to the situation. You know, not all of us are Torah scholars, and even if we have some knowledge, we may not have the time to utilize it. The everyday challenges of just living life takes up the majority of our time and energies. Though we may not be able to reach the heights of learning and service to God that those elite spiritual athletes can attain, still, that does not mean that we don't have the obligation to push ourselves to reach higher than we thought possible. Look at what these Special Olympians have accomplished physically. That should help us to attain the spiritual heights that we need, that we should aspire to, for us to reach. Which brings us to an even more amazing level of Olympians, those who compete in the Paralympic Games. These games were organized by Ludwig Gutmann, a noted neurosurgeon who performed extensive research on spinal cord injuries and conducted numerous neurosurgeon procedures. He was known as Germany's top neurosurgeon, and in 1933, he was appointed the director of the Witzel Hankel Hospital in Breslau. However, he was fired from that position in the very same year due to his Jewish heritage. He fled Germany after Little Night with his family in 1939, and found his way to London. He settled in Oxford, where he was initially hmm, not allowed to practice medicine. He continued his research on spinal injury and was soon recognized as one of the most influential neuroscientists in England. Four years later, he was asked by the British government to establish the first National Spinal Injury Center at Stoke Madville Hospital in Buckinghamshire. He led that center for, 22 years, for the next 22 years. Gutmann was certain that the importance of sports for the promotion of physical strength and self-respect in paraplegic paraplegi paraplegi patient population. When he first came to the hospital, he witnessed patients just lying in their beds, heavily sedated. He believed strongly that sports were a major method in the treatment of paraplegics. Gutmann organized basketball competitions between the hospital staff and their patients. To even out the competition, the doctors and nurses were required to play in wheelchairs. Playing sports in a wheelchair gave them, gave the staff a better understanding and a deeper appreciation for the challenges that their patients had to endure daily. The methods that he introduced in the hospital are still being used today as therapy. He started the first Stoke Madville Games for Disabled Persons, featuring an archery competition. More events were added in subsequent years. The event became internationalized in 1952. He also founded the Paralympic Games in 1948. In 1960, he achieved his vision of an international tournament equivalent to the Olympic Games. When in that year, the international Stoke Madville Games were held alongside the official Summer Olympics in Rome. This was the birth of the Paralympic Games. They have become so successful that they follow immediately after the Olympics in the same location, which means that this year the Paralympics will be held in China beginning on March 1st. One can compare Gutmann's insight to that of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson of Blessed Memory. The Rebbe saw a world filled with spiritual paraplegics, people who suffer from all sorts, all forms of godliness and depravity. People in the 1950s in the United States thought that living an orthodox lifestyle 
was beyond the ability of the average Jew. Orthodox Judaism would be reserved for the spiritual elite. In a study done in 1955, Marshall Sklar defined conservative Judaism as quintessential American Jewish moment, pardon me, movement. The Rebbe disagreed strongly and started an outreach mo movement that not only changed the United States, it changed the world. Goodman saved those paraplegics who had forgotten, who had been forgotten, and the Rebbe served, saved God who had been forgotten. Quoting from the official website, the Paraplemic Games is a periodic series of international multi-sport events involving athletes with a range of physical disabilities. They include impaired muscle power, impaired passive range of mo movement, limb deficiency, leg length difference, short stature, hypertonia, ataxia, athesosis, vision impairment, and intellectual impairment. The size and diversity of the Paralympic Games have increased greatly over the years. The Paralympic Games in 1960 hosted 400 athletes from 23 countries, participating in eight sports. Just over 50 years later, at the 2012 Summer of Paralympic Games in London, more than 4,200 athletes representing 164 countries participated in 20 sports. Every athlete from the elite to the paraplegic, from the gifted to the uncoordinated, from the pro to the weekend warrior, they all have one thing in common, a love of the game and a desire to win. They love to compete. They have come to realize that it is the caliber of the competition that raises your level and makes you better. You don't have to win to be a winner, but they all do come to understand and appreciate no pain, no gain. You must put in the work. Success may belong to God, but we own effort. As Ben Hay Hay said in Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers, the Fum Atzara Agra, commensurate to the difficulty, is the reward. There was a rabbi, a teacher in a religious high school. Someone noticed that during a break in classes, this teacher would sit outside and watch the boys play sports. It seemed strange. After all, this teacher had no interest in sports whatsoever. So this person asked the rabbi why he was outside watching the boys play. The rabbi answered. He would watch the boys to see who hustled on the playground. If a young man was lazy in the classroom and also lazy when he played sports, well, there was little he felt he could do to motivate that student. However, if he saw a student who was lazy in the classroom, but aggressive and hustling on the field, <laughs> then he knew he had what to work with. He just had to find the right key to get the student excited. As I thought about these three events, the Olympics, the Special Olympics, and the Paralympics, I wondered if the magnus opus of the Chabad Hasidus movement, the Tanya, written by the founder of the movement, Rabbi Schneer Zalman of the D, could be connected to my thought on Olympics. In the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe describes five types of individuals that are broken up into three categories. The first category is the Tzaddik Vitovlo, the righteous individual who has good, and then the Tzaddik Viralo, the righteous individual who has evil. Second category he calls the Benini, the middle of the road individual. And the third category is called the Russia Vitovlo, the evil individual who has good in Russia, the Ravo, and the evil individual who has bad. These three categories may well connect with our three Olympic events. Less than 3,000 athletes competed in the 2022 Olympics in China, a very small fraction of the world population. And out of that number, how many were able to receive a gold medal? I think that God Almighty has put each one of us into this world with a specific mission. We are all given the tools to be able to achieve that mission. Some people are born with a tzaddik soul. They are, so to speak, the gold medal winners. They are the tzaddikim that have good. They are the elevated Olympians, our spiritual leaders and guides. The second category, the tzaddikim that have bad, allude to individuals that though they have a tzaddik soul, are not on the same level as the gold medal winners. However, they are nonetheless superstars, head and shoulders above the masses. 
they still have the capability and the responsibility of being examples for all of us to follow. Then there is the Bainini, the average person. They would connect to the Special Olympics. Personally, I don't think that anyone is average. Everyone is special. This group consists of what I refer to as the herd, the majority of the population. Everyday people, those who go about their daily lives, facing the challenges that all of us must learn to navigate. Every one of us is an addict in some form or another. We all face difficulties in life and that we must overcome. The Bainini, even though they may not be gifted, still needs to cultivate all the traits that are necessary for the elite athlete or spiritual leader to succeed. To be truly successful, the Bainini also needs to dedicate themselves to the task at hand. They face the greatest test in life to overcome their own unique nature. The final category that the Tanya mentions is the Russia, the evil person. This connects to the Paralympians, those individuals that face the hardest challenge of all. They, might, they have to navigate life without all the physical and mental blessings that most of us take for granted. This category is divided into two parts. The first deals with the rush of Vitovlo. I would like to take poetic license and translate this to mean a severely challenged individual who has overcome their challenges. The rush of Vitovlo is our poster boy. In spite of all their challenges, they still manage to compete on a very high level. Their accomplishments, though they are nowhere near as physically impressive as the elite Olympians, still their accomplishments, overcoming their handicaps, makes them the true superstars. <clears throat> and in comparison, their achievements dwarf <clears throat> the achievements of the other two categories. As our rabbis tell us that a Baal Tshuva, a repentant individual, is even greater than a tzaddik. The second category is the Russia Viralo, which I translate as the severely challenged individual who has not yet overcome their challenges. You know, there's a tendency in life when things get tough, many people just give up. Think of how many people start a workout regimen on New Year's Day, only to give it up weeks, if not days, later. In sports, as in life, the swing is critical to success. However, even more important than the swing is the follow-through. Without a strong and fluid follow-through, you will never succeed. One has to stay focused from the beginning from the beginning of the swing until the end. So too in life. Those who fall into the category of Russia, Viralo, are those who start a project, they swing, but somehow they never seem to be able to finish their challenge, the follow-through. So what do we learn from these three Olympic events? Something that will help us in our relationship with God and in our connection to serving Him in our daily lives. Regardless of whether you're an Olympian, or just a weekend athlete. Before anything else, first and foremost, you need <clears throat> a blessing from God Almighty, <clears throat> excuse me, for good health. What we have seen is that there are common denominators needed to succeed in both athletics and religion, such as discipline, dedication, confidence, desire, belief, focus. All of these traits are necessary to succeed. But in the end, what we need to know is that success is a gift from God. What we own is effort, no pain, no gain. If you put all of your energies into living life and practicing religion, then you can be certain that in the end, in the, end the results has to be true success. A feeling of contentment knowing that you are, did the best that you could do. You are a winner. And the medal that you will be awarded may well be a happier and healthier lifestyle in addition to your one-way ticket to heaven. And with that advice, let us dedicate ourselves to bringing in Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Again, I think it's an important subject. It ran a little longer than usual, but I thought this, the, all this had to be said. Again, God bless. Be well. Be happy. Be healthy. Be safe. Have a great Shabbos. And again, thank you for attending.